So I think that was pretty bracing, um, particularly the first example. Um, everyone in my table who was looking at their phone suddenly looked up um, because that level of personal, visceral violence with absolute impunity is not something many people in this room have had to face firsthand, even though some of us come from countries where it's an absolute fact. I just wondered how much this idea of privileged violence is actually embedded in models of development, because it felt like a kind of spray of intensely icy water coming into this room. <laughs> um, so I'm Alaskan, so there's a lot of sprays of intensely yeah. icy water that come into my life in general. Um, so the development community was slow to recognize the effects of violence on development, I think. Um, when I came to that realization in India, there was no talk about it at all. And I had to go to sort of funny parts of the World Bank that were working on rule of law early, early on. That was the year 2000. But by 2011, the World Development Report had put a finger on it. And they said, look, violence and conflict, they matter for development. And it took another couple of years for the SDGs to take them in. But I think now the development community does understand that this matters, what they are just starting to do is figure out how to deal with that fact. So the recognition that it matters is there, but then, okay, so how do you have what they call conflict sensitive um, programming is new. And what I'm saying here is, look, it's fine to have conflict sensitive programming, but that's only 17% of the violence. A lot of the violence is happening in places that aren't in conflict. And so how do you have organized crime sensitive uh, programming? And it's a whole nother step. I mean, your picture of it, and obviously it's your perspective, is that this is so intrinsic to so many cultures, particularly where you have vast gaps between rich and poor. It was quite hard to see how you could get out of it. I mean, you talk Thirds about... The block is on how you get out of well, it. Well, I'm jolly glad about that. But, um, I mean, you talk about, interestingly, that criminal gangs have actually become substitute welfare states for some communities. That's not new. That's also, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood did that in Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you talk about the normalisation of violence, where the slaughter of... 10 innocent native Brazilians is just boasted about in a bar. And you elided that with violence against women, which is from time immemorial, since men and women got back to each other. Um, and then you talk about this extraordinary level of denial amongst the middle classes in these environments. How is that level of denial maintained by those people? So we should all look at ourselves at this mm -hmm. moment. I mean, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. New Mexico, Albuquerque, the city 40 minutes to our south is under uh, Department of Justice uh, regulation right now because of the extraordinary level of violence there. In my city, where I live, I can leave my house unlocked on the east side. On the south side, the level of violence and really nasty child abuse and so on, the opioid epidemic, is immense. But you know what? That's not my kid's school. And I'd, if I go to Home Depot, I go during the day. I don't go at night. Right? So you're not personally affected as the middle class. And um, it's those people are far away and they often look different. And so in the book I talk about um, the numbers in LA in the early 90s when um, America had its last spike in violence, the, the rate of violent death for most people in LA was seven per 100,000, which is slightly elevated. In America right now, it's about five per 100,000. Um, if you were black, it was 71 per 100,000. So it's 10 times higher if you were white versus black. Well, that gives you a lot of safety if you're white. Um, but you know what, if you're a black woman, you were also pretty safe because for black men, young black men, it was 368 per 100,000. So right, who was really being hit by violence? It was a small subset of the population that an awful lot of people could distance themselves from and say, oh, that's terrible, but it's not us. And you know what, there's an awful lot of stuff going on in Compton. There's a lot of gangs, there's a lot of violence. So it's not that hard to distance. But if you're in a country which you're talking about, a first world country, if you're in a a less first world country, surely it impinges somewhat more than that. When I was in South Africa and wanted to go and buy a bag because I'd been shopping and it was literally a 20 minute walk and I said to the guy I was at the conference with, I'm just going to walk there and he said, no, you're not. And it literally would have been physically dangerous for me to do it. It never crossed my mind because I was in such a, a cosy place. And you know, all the friends that I had in South Africa, they were like living in armed camps. So it is there. but. I just, I'm just fascinated by the level of denial that happens. Um, so you're absolutely right. It's not, in some places it is harder to deny, but it's easier to make personal decisions that protect yourself than it is to um, do collective action. It's hard to do collective yeah. action and you need somebody to glom onto. So part, there's a whole chapter in the book about social movements and how you get social movements going because you know, I live in Santa Fe and it makes me very sad the level of violence. What do I do about it? I'm busy and I'm raising two kids and 
if I could do a little bit, I would do something. If there was somebody I could contribute some money to who's running for office, I, but if there's none of that, wh where do you start? It's easier to put a better lock on your door. So you talk about social movements, you talked about to us. You also said it's a very frightening place to be to take on violence. So even the sense of social movements, surely in many countries, it's very, it must be very hard to get those things going. What's an example that's worked that you've seen? So I chart a whole series of examples that work from um, Colombia's movement to have a new constitution in 1991 at the height of their drug violence where some social entrepreneurs basically got students on the street and then got millions of Colombians on the street to say, basically to bridge a polarized divide, the real hard part of a social movement isn't finding these amazing individuals willing to put themselves in violence's way. For whatever reason, those people exist in all countries. I don't know, I'm not one of them, I'm a kind of scaredy cat myself, I've faced enough violence to not really want to face much more, but um, those people exist who are really heroic. The harder part is bridging the partisan divide. Mm -hmm. So these social movements have to find a way to not fall into polarized rhetoric that allows the other half of the country, because by definition these are polarized countries, to dismiss them. So in Colombia, it wasn't, are you with the guerrillas or are you with the mm -hmm. paramilitaries? It was, can we all agree our country's broken enough that we should have a new constitutional moment? And people could agree on that. In Sicily, it wasn't, are you with the Christian Democrats or the communists, which was the fight then. That was an unbridgeable divide because the communists were funded by the Soviet International and, and the Christian Democrats made sure everyone knew it. And the Christian Democrats were supported by the mafia and the communists. So you, you'd pick your side and it was your family's side. It's like voting for the Boston Red Sox, right? You're not gonna become a Yankees fan. Um, that is not gonna change. So what you need to do is come up with a social movement that finds another way. So interestingly, lots of our speakers have talked about the dangers of absolutist identities um, in all sorts of ways from, from Frank Fukuyama on. They've talked about if you define a movement or a country or a nationalism by an absolutist pure identity, you by definition separate everyone who isn't that. So you're saying you have to find stories that actually create different kinds of identities and overlaps. I think it is stories about identity, but I also think it's, in a certain way, more transactional than, than that. You need real social leaders who are willing to make pretty significant compromises. So in the book, I tell the story of the civil rights movement in America. The story of the civil rights movement that we grow up with in storybooks, in our, you know, we're taught in high school, is that there was this movement, it was just, it was right, and Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, and as he signed it with the flourish, he said, I've lost the South for a generation. And the idea is that he did the right thing, but he lost the South for a generation for his party. Well, that's not at all the story of the Civil Rights mm. Movement. The Civil Rights Movement was not particularly, it was popular in sort of a general sense, but on any particular, if you ask people, do you support the freedom riding? No, they don't, that's too far. Do you support this or that? It was actually very hard to build a movement that could get middle class support, and they very carefully crafted it to get whites into the game, make sure that middle class whites cared, it was their kids on the line. But then the social leaders, so that, that was a step, mm -hmm. right? Because the social leaders had to say, we're not gonna be an exclusively African-American movement. We're gonna bring in white people because we need their support. The other move they made, and you can imagine now with Black Lives Matter, that being a controversial step. The other move they made was um, they allowed Lyndon Johnson to take credit. Now Lyndon Johnson had voted against every single civil rights measure as a senator. He'd voted against Harry Truman when Harry Truman tried to desegregate the military mm -hmm. in the 40s. That was his own president from his own party. Mm -hmm. He was not a great civil rights leader. He was a very savvy guy and knew where his party was going. And not only that, he was prosecuting the Vietnam War, which was massively unpopular. So it's, it's like in America, if Black Lives Matter teamed up with Inhofe, you know, one of our most conservative senators, and um, me, or George W. Bush, and, and then George W. Bush went off to fight the Iraq War, it would be massively unpopular. So these leaders, have to bring their followers along, and that's a really difficult step that they need to be able to do. You talked about leaders who make a difference have to do dirty deals. How uncomfortable is that for people in the development world, Western politicians, particularly I always think American politicians, who from my European perspective seem stunningly naive about humanity, but how, 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 um, how, how easy is it for those kinds of politicians and policy makers and development workers to deal with the dirty deal, the compromise? So DFID funded all this research mm -hmm. and, um, and they are fabulous funders who kind of let me do my thinking without a lot of interference and um, like a lot of uh, other development areas. And um, they've published some great papers on this through the UK Stabilization Unit on 
basically the fact that these um, political settlements, they call them elite political settlements, need to be made and that they are not particularly inclusive and so on. The problem is they don't last. Mm -hmm. So Barry Weingast, when North Walson Weingast wrote about this and they said, you know, you need to make these deals. And I cornered Barry at a conference and I said, you know, what I find is that you do need to make these deals, but then they unravel. The state becomes more illegitimate. The whole thing goes back. And he said, oh yeah, we found they last for eight years. Mm -hmm. I said, well, it would have been helpful to put that in your book. <laughs> that would have been useful. So they, they have to make them. And the difficulty, I think, is that they have to make them and then you have to take them apart. And development agencies have to admit both steps. And right now, we don't have either step really on our radar. So um, you get the Colombian peace agreement, which was a darn good peace agreement. Mm -hmm. And then you get a backlash. And all of a sudden, you have a much dirtier deal. You have a deal that lets the paramilitary and a lot of the military folks off the hook. How do you move from that to a better peace? That's the real question we need to be asking ourselves in the development field. And I don't think we're asking that yet. That is rather a pessimistic take on the dirty deal. If it only lasts eight years, how salient is it? It still needs to be made, because at that point, the state is so weak. You know, when I was talking with um, the mayor of Palermo in Sicily, he said that when he was mayor at the height of the mafia uh, wars, he didn't trust his secretary. He sort of assumed that anything he passed through his secretary was going to make it back to Cosa Nostra. When you have a state that's that permeated with um, bad actors, you need to make the deals. And so uh, it's, a, it's like a grown-up's view of the world, you know, this book. It's not, there's, there's not unicorns and roses. It's a tough road, but it's not an impossible road. And I think acknowledging that you have to get your hands a little dirty, the book ends up being kind of a pay on to politicians, which I hadn't expected at all. Mm. I spent a decade running a political group that, where I worked with a lot of politicians and I didn't like a lot of them. I, they're not my kind of person. They're, I'm a reformer. I'm like, I don't like dirty things that are compromising. But you know what? You need those people in a democracy to make that kind of deal and to make it stick. And so I have a lot of respect for them. And is that perhaps more difficult at the moment when people are so pol polarized and the sort of sense of angry self-righteousness that permeates so much political dialogue is kind of the, the thing of the moment? Does that make that more difficult? All these societies are highly polarized because by definition, that's where violence is happening. The polarization stops the society from solving the problem. Um, so yes, I think it is more difficult. I think it takes very unusual people who can bridge that. And it takes them making very unusual and difficult decisions. The person who gets you there can't necessarily get you the whole way. You talked about 41 BIS, this anti-mafia law. Draconian, highly effective because it's isolation. Does the means and the ends argument kind of play out in all of this? Just like the dirty deal, you have to be prepared to do some things that actually in pure democratic, liberal democracies look pretty uncomfortable. Yes and no, in that I think you do, but then I think they also undermine themselves. So I think these things are very double-edged swords and we have to acknowledge both sides. Um, what I found was that the RICO laws in America, our racketeering and yeah. corruption laws, were actually literally translated, Falcone, the prosecutor, um, had helped us with a case known as Pizzagate. It was the case in which most of the heroin that was being marketed in the United States was coming from the Italian mafia. And Falcone had a part of the puzzle and we had a part of the puzzle and they came together. He was so entranced with the RICO laws that he translated them into Italian. And then um, when the mayor of Palermo got uh, a call saying that he was gonna get hit by the mafia, he, through a funny series of coincidences, went to the Republic of Georgia um, he had found a book in the, in the annals of the Palermo you know, basement that was a Georgian grammar that a Sicilian monk had created a years, hundred years before or something. And so he was really excited about Georgia and it was pet. So he had to go somewhere that looked sufficiently mayoral and they had a sister city in Georgia. So he went to Georgia and when the Rose Revolution happened and Saakashvili needed help with organized crime, he called the mayor of Palermo. So there's this kind of weird <laughs> transmission of the RICO laws, but now they're just well known. So those laws, don't necessarily lead to authoritarianism. But these leaders do have egos. And so they tend to become darker and darker in their uses of these powers. And they do need to be tossed out. Um, so um, imperfection is really your rule of law, isn't it? Do uh, not expect too much and, and imperfection and constant surveillance of what's going on. It's, it's a world in which you have to take small wins yeah. and small wins can lead to bigger wins and bigger wins, but you can't move to perfection. These are very violent societies that can get a lot better and we should be happy that they can get a lot better even if they can't get perfect. Questions? Yes. 
Well done. Thanks. Rachel, fantastic um, presentation and fantastic book. Um, I wonder, so the, the core dynamics of how you get out of this vicious cycle has to do with the civil society and leaders that do dirty deals. And the dynamics that you described are, in a sense, fundamentally domestic, right? So there are internal dynamics, and the drivers of the conflict are fundamentally internal, in a sense. And I wondered if you have thoughts about how you get out of that violent cir circle of crime and violence when a, a substantial part of the violence is driven by external dynamics. And I think many of the key conflicts, the really violent places, and I know you talked about this, you know, there are places we think of as violent and the places that we don't think of as violent. And you're talking really about the latter places where you have states and you don't think of them as fundamentally broken. But in a lot of, you know, you think about Afghanistan, you know, the drivers of that conflict are, to a significant extent, external whether to do with the United States, whether to do with Pakistan. When you think of Syria, the same thing is true. So how do you get out of that cycle when it's not about internal dynamics, but a substantial part of the driver of violence is external dynamics? I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Fabulous question. Um, my answer is going to be even more depressing. The book really is a very hopeful book. I yes, 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 we're well, sure it is. <laughs> it's positive. Um, but this answer is going to be depressing. I mean, it was, it was President Diaz, right, who, who said, you know, oh, poor Mexico so close to the United States, so far from God. Um, you know, this is the basic, is, so why is Latin America so violent, the most violent region? We think the most violent region. I, I actually question this because we don't have stats for Sub-Saharan Africa. We actually have no idea what's going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. But um, what's the dynamic? Well, the biggest drug market in the world is on one side, and the place where you grow cocaine is on this, lat this latitude, and you're stuck in the middle. Right, so that violence is going to be somewhere. And this story is, is really, I mean, it sounds like this really big story, but in fact, it's a fairly little story. It's a story of why is it in this country and not in that country, right? Why is it in Guatemala and not in Costa Rica? Um, that matters, but as long as the biggest drug market in the world is here and it's illegal, it's going to be somewhere in there. And so I think you're, you're right. The international dynamics, you know, if you're near Russia and Russia's trying to interfere with your politics, um, and create conflict on your borders. That's the story of the Republic of Georgia. Um, you're going to have conflict and violence, but there is a lot you can do endogenously. And I think while you have to both admit these external factors and you have to admit that you have a lot of agency. You know, the Republic of Georgia is in a really bad neighborhood, and yet they did immense change there. Um, Tunisia is in a really bad neighborhood, and yet managed to fight its violence in a way that Libya hasn't managed. So I think that one of the things that external actors can do is, you know, they can cause this kind of conflict dynamic. The other thing we can do is make it harder for these countries to solve their own problems, right? So a lot of this kind of privileged violence is rooted in corruption, not 100% of it, but a lot of it. That corruption is being um, laundered through New York, not Nigeria. It's being laundered through London, through Vancouver, through Miami. So there's a lot we can do with our laws and so on to make that harder. Um, there's a lot we can do with what we call the third tier, right? the lawyers and the accountants and so on that help this kind of criminal violence. There's a lot we could do to make that harder for that to happen. So, Thank you. Gentlemen over here. Rachel, thanks for your comments. Um, in some s previous sessions in this conference, we have uh, been discussing about, you know, what is it that is generating this wave of populism that is, uh, you know, the rise of populist uh, uh, regimes uh, being elected. You know, some of the discussion yesterday with Francis Fukuyama and others, you know, li link that to, uh, you, know, f uh, uh, you know, inequality or, or some imbalance in you know, various components of, you know, power, state, a, a, a democracy. We are seeing, however, that in many countries, you know, uh, because of violence or because of the lack of, you know, uh, uh, sufficient security, uh, that is being used uh, by uh, populist candidates as a platform to get elected. And you showed actually one slide, you know, uh, uh, of a campaign poster related to that. Would you say that countries that do 
fail to provide security are going to be at the margin more prone to see these populist governments or uh, candidates being elected because just people are too desperate and whoever offers them any hope of, uh, of uh, an improvement uh, of uh, security uh, you know, uh, is just going to be a more uh, attractive candidate. Thanks. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, security is a pretty basic one. Um, and so I think if people feel insecure, and there can be various kinds of insecurity, right? You can feel physically insecure, but you can also feel insecure in your status, um, and you can feel economically insecure. And these things are actually mixed up in people's heads. So for a decade, I ran a more political organization. We ran candidates and all sorts of things, and we did a polling. And I was trying to figure out um, questions about Democrats and national security. So we kept asking focus groups and so on about Democrats and national security. We kept hearing answers about economic insecurity. Mm. And the pollster was working on this and working on this. And then finally he realized in people's minds these were very linked. Mm. And actually they were right. You know, if you're economically weak, if you feel economically insecure, your nation is less secure. So these various kinds of insecurity, I think, are very, very deep and very, very basic to people's sense of self. And um, which is why I think tough on crime policies tend to, to win. And it is very undermining to democracy. In the book I talk a little bit about... Um, how we measured democracy, and I put myself in this camp as like a democracy, student of democracy. When we early on measured democracy, before Polity 4, when you basically had like Freedom House measures and so on, we were measuring absence of authoritarian rule. And so we measured civil liberties and various political rights. We didn't measure violence and we didn't measure corruption. We didn't even think about that as a measure, because we were looking at authoritarianism to democracy. And so countries could score quite high on democracy while corruption and violence were also rising, and they were just two different measures. And what I say in the book is that we were using this 20th century ruler that was based on isms, right? Are you fascist? Are you communist? Are you democratic? But in the 21st century, what you were getting was not based on isms. It was based on power. You were getting oligarchies that were basically about who holds power, and it didn't really matter if you were a democratic oligarchy or a fascist oligarchy or a co communist oligarchy. It, what really matters is who held power. And so to the people, they said, look, you might call yourself a democracy, but what we see is we don't have any power. It's the same old families that have power. And now we have violence. And so of course you're not going to be supportive of that system. And so you see those numbers when you look at the Latino barometer, for instance, on support for democracy as the violence rises. It doesn't decline entirely. People do still value the freedom that they have. But when your freedom is to get out in an armored car and not walk 20 minutes, it's a pretty limited freedom. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes, gentlemen here. Thank you. Hernando Jose Gomez from Colombia. Uh, in my life, I've had seen many dirty deals no? in, <laughs> in our society, many, many. And I suppose some of my co-nationals will, 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 will agree with that. But one of the problems there is that the people that have to do the dirty deals, no? usually in the moment, all society are behind them, uh, actively or passively, they accept the, the dirty deals. But once the situation gets better later, then they start, those people that supported passively probably the dirty deal start questioning the, the, the guys that did the, the dirty deal. So then you start again a new round of polarization in society of those that feel that are better than the others that had to do the dirty deal. So it, I don't know if this, these dirty deals in the end really solve the situation for good or basically are the seed of new rounds, no? a violence, a weakening of the state, et cetera. I know, what, uh, what's your vision on that? So at the talk I just gave right before this talk over the Belfer Center, President Santos was in the audience. Um, a few know better than him the cost of, of exactly that dynamic that you're talking about. Um, I think you're right, and I think it is perhaps inevitable. It's kind of human nature to bite the hand that feeds you uh, because people don't like being dirty. And one thing you see in polls is that even in the most corrupt states, people don't like being corrupt. They don't want to admit what they themselves do, right? So maybe you did implicitly agree to a gang deal or a drug dealer deal or, you know, whatever the deal is. But later on, you want to pretend you didn't. You see this in voting, right? Whoever wins, far more people claim that they voted for the winner than voted for the loser afterward, even though the numbers don't match up at all. Right? People, people change their, maybe they change internally, who knows? But... 
so you're right, and I think it's human, and it's probably psychological, and it takes someone who's a psychologist to get into that. That's not me. I do think, however, that it's not deadly, and that Andy Mack, who writes the Human Security Report, he's a Canadian academic, has traced that in new outbreaks of violence, the violence tends to be lower than in past outbreaks. And so it's, it's not a straight line. I totally agree with you that it's this very jagged line. It's an ugly path. Um, it's not an escalator. And, and I have a graphic that I showed here that's supposed to be like chutes and ladders. But when, um, when I asked the graphic designer to draw it, he said, there's no ladders. Um, I said, yeah, there's no ladders. It's just chutes. Um, but so it's not an easy path. But each time a little more violence gets out of the system, you know, it's like you're squeezing a wet towel. A little bit more gets out, and it's still wet. And so I think you're right on the dynamic. I don't think it's, it, it doesn't kill the whole project. Interestingly, a very pallid example compared to many in South America, but the Good Friday Agreement with the IRA is now being systematically unpicked because part of the dirty deal was immunity for some IRA terrorists. And their names are now being revealed. And it's just fascinating to watch a whole population that was so relieved they weren't being blown up by the IRA um, kind of begin to rethink what the deal was. And, baff and you can see the politicians who did it kind of baffled because actually at the time people were concerned about the compromises but accepted them. Mind you, we've learned we're not very good at compromises in the UK rather recently. Um, anything else from anyone else? Well, one more? Brilliant. From Ricardo himself. Thank you, Rachel. That was, that was great. Um, you mentioned a really interesting and long stairway to hell, <laughs> right? That, uh, you know, first you get, uh, you know, the re a reason to, co co you know, uh, to tolerate violence, then uh, people start self-protecting and, uh, and the police gets corrupt. And, and so the stuff, you know, there, there's layers in which, you know, the system unravels. Um, now, you talked about to, to turn the situation around, you need a social movement, and you need a dirty deal. But where in this line of you know, disastrous causality uh, do you have the dirty deal? Because you can, might have the dirty deal at the top, but you're left with no police service or no court system. Or no, so how, how in, the, in, the, in the countries you've studied and in Italy and in Colombia and Georgia and so on. It, how do you turn around beyond the dirty deal at the top? How do you fix the whole chain of events? Um, so it's a fabulous question. And while I had to depict it in a kind of linear fashion, it's not at all linear. And you can make a lot of dirty deals. So in Colombia, as you said, there have been a whole series in there. They build on each other. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I have a lot of respect for Colombia and how it's sort of pulled itself out. And it goes backwards. So, you know, you have um, the constitutional moment in 1991, and it's a big social movement, and you get people on the street, and they create a new constitution, and a former guerrilla group gets to be a part of that constitutional moment, and that sends the right wing back into the arms of the paramilitary. And they say, no, 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 we don't want guerrillas to be part of our political system. And so, you know, you have this, this chance, and then the social violence starts up again. And so then you have another chance. And so these things aren't clean. But, but the society can, can absorb some of that. Um, and you can have parts that are working at slightly different levels of momentum. I think what, what really needs to happen quickly is that, that troika of dirty deal, immediately to a more inclusive state to sort of not unravel the deal in the way that you're talking about, but to, but to, tell, to, to complicate the picture in people's minds. And often that's different level, levels of politician, as I said. Um, it doesn't have to be the same level. Um, and the fighting. Those three things have to be very closely linked because you have to get, get enough violence out of the system through the deal that the state can actually function. It's still a very weak state. And enough violence has to come out that the state isn't so overwhelmed and that the, through personal, basically just personal force of will, you can get parts of your state 
working enough to fight the rest of the violence. But at the same time you're fighting, you need to be signaling to um, the parts of the, the state that you need to, to give you the information that you're serious. So to go back to Colombia, just because we're talking about Colombia, but I can talk about the other countries. You know, Uribe is well known for fighting the violence with Plan Colombia and so on. And in the United States, we tell ourselves that we did such a great thing for Colombia. But, but if you look at the whole plan, one of the things that's really unheralded is Uribe had an amnesty plan for guerrillas that doesn't get talked about, but was hugely important to getting enough guerrillas to defect mm -hmm. that they could get the information they needed to fight the rest of the FARC. They couldn't have done the fighting without the amnesty plan because that's how they got the intelligence. And so those three things need to be very closely linked. Um, and, and the rest of it can kind of come and go. I think we've run out of time. Can we show our appreciation? A fascinating <laughs> talk.